Well, again, welcome. We're, we're really glad that you're able to be with us this morning. My name is Matthew Wiley. I'm the managing director here at the Henry Center. And what we try to do is uh, bridge the gap between the academy and the church by cultivating resources and communities that advance Christian wisdom. And our public events this year have been a series of theological reflections on discipleship. And we're delighted today to wrap up the year with Dr. Kapik. Uh, after Dr. Kapik's lecture, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A moderated by Professor DeVale. So please do hold on to any questions that you have, and we'll have time for that after the lecture. Let me now introduce this morning's speaker. Dr. Kelly Kapik is Professor of Theological Studies at Covenant College in Lookout Mountain, Georgia. He earned his PhD at King's College London, where he studied with Colin Gunton. And Dr. Kapik is the author of numerous books, including Communion with God, The Divine and Human in John Owen's Theology, Embodied Hope, which won a 2017 Book of the Year Award from Christianity Today, and most recently, You're Only Human, How Your Limits Reflect God's Design and Why That's Good News. His scholarship and ministry achieve uh, what we try to accomplish at the Henry Center of bridging the gap between the academy and the church, and he embodies the collaborative spirit that we're aiming for. So we're really glad to have him with us this morning. Would you join me in welcoming Dr. Kelly Kapik? Well, it is a delight to, to be with you all. Um, I, I think highly of Trinity. I myself um, was a Wheaton grad uh, for undergrad, but I have uh, thought highly of Trinity for a long time. A couple of my best friends and colleagues, Jay Green and Hans Matawame, are both uh, alum here. They're great teachers, just don't tell them that. They, you know, but they do represent uh, Trinity well. So I'm delighted to be here. Um, I, one of the things I've always appreciated about Trinity is its willingness to engage the church and not just a denomination of the church, but the broader church, particularly the broader evangelical church, uh, to think through it. So um, it's a delight to be here. And this morning, um, as, as I said, we'd like you to come uh, think through this topic of discipleship and some of your work and some of what you're doing. Uh, and, and as I was trying to think through how I want to arrange it, I, I was in a bit of a dilemma because in some ways I want to look back and I want to talk about some themes from the book, You're Only Human, but uh, I also want to point a little bit forward. Uh, so I just want to give you a sense of how we're going to arrange this. I said, you know, I'd like you to talk for about 55 minutes or an hour. So this is what it looks like. Sorry that you're like, what? <laughs> but anyways, that's what they told me. So suck it up, right? There you go. Um, no, but really, so what's going to happen is for about the first 35 minutes, I really want to concentrate on the importance of the church for discipleship with a particular uh, lens in terms of recognizing how our limits might shape our experience of the church. And in some ways, this is an apologetic for the importance of the church in a time when a lot of us, including me, are quite tempted to be cynical about the value of the institutional church. Um, and I think as evangelicals, uh, whatever that term means these days, but uh, we tend to have a weak or underdeveloped ecclesiology, and so I want to spend some time on that. But then I want to spend maybe 15 minutes or so at the end kind of pointing forward to how I'm thinking about um, this potentially follow-up in terms of go therefore and make humans. Like, how does this uh, relate? And I want to think about... Um, what I think are some rich opportunities to both hold together liberation and agency, realism and hope, valuing the cross and the resurrection. So I want to start, the first part, which will be the majority of it, is really asking, do we need the church? And I know it's an academic lecture, but if you don't mind, I'd love us to pray. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that you are faithful, that you are good, and that you are beautiful. And we pray that you would lift our gaze to your holiness, to your joy, to your love. Help us to not be cynical, but hopeful. We pray all this in the name of the risen King and by his spirit. Amen. All right, so let's start to think through the importance of the church. And the first thing I actually want to ask is can we ignore... God's commandments. Can we ignore God's commandments? It's going to be hard for me. I told them, you, you put a mic here and I can't roam. 
So I'll do my best to stay in front of the mic. But um, I, had, uh, I had a former student of mine um, who is, does campus ministry in California. And I'll never forget some years ago, he called me and he was doing campus ministry and he's pouring himself out. He's a single guy uh, working hard. And he called me and he basically said, I am really struggling because I cannot get Matthew 25 out of my head. Now, to remind you, the part he's talking about from Matthew 25, it's the episode of the sheep and the goats, which it's in red, so we have to, like, listen to that, right? You're like, oh, some of you are offended by that. It's okay. You're going to be fine. So, like... How, how, do, how should we think about this, right? And as you know, in this, in this group, you know, the sheep go to, you know, as, um, uh, what was the, oh, cake, right? They had that song, sheep go to heaven, goats go to hell. Some of you in the age group know <laughs> yeah. that. Anyways, you can look it up on Spotify later. But the sheep go to heaven, goats go to hell. It's a pretty sobering passage. How do we think about this, right? And here was my friend who has poured himself out in ministry. He poured himself out into people's lives. He's a single guy with limited financial resources and just doesn't have any more bandwidth to go and to do more. But he's an honest broker. And fear lingered in his psychology. Was he a goat? Maybe he said he could find another hour or two in his week to start working at a homeless shelter, right? And just to make sure we're all on the same page, I don't want to assume, but the difference between the sheep and the goat in the episode, not drawing from a bunch of other places in the Bible, but in that pericope is, do you feed the hungry? Do you clothe the naked? Do you visit the prisoners? Right? This movement toward the marginalized. And so Matt was struggling. And I think when we hear a story like Matt's, our instinct is like, dude, chill out. Relax, it's not a big deal. You have too tender of a conscience. Nothing to be anxious about here. Before we make that move, I'd like us to actually give him credit, first of all. I'd like us to give him credit that he doesn't just ignore scripture, including the painful places that make many of us uncomfortable in terms of discipleship. He takes Jesus and Jesus' words seriously. He knows Jesus isn't messing around. And that's what worries Matt. Is he a goat? Am I? Are you? We don't tend to feel Matt's existential crisis. Not, and I mean this, by and large, not because our theology is better than his. We mostly ignore the scriptures that make us uncomfortable and that seem too extreme. Sometimes they say, well, that's just a social justice issue. That's not a gospel issue. Really? We don't, we don't need to take greed and lust so seriously, even though Jesus starts talking about cutting off limbs. Isn't that interesting? When we preach a passage like that, the very first thing we say to our people is, hey, he didn't mean it. <laughs> like, maybe next time you and I do that, like, let's just hold off on the he didn't mean it thing so quickly. Otherwise, all the power's gone. I'll just tell you as an aside, I think he did mean it. I know you and Hermeneutics are preaching. I think he meant it, and the reason why I think he meant it is because he doesn't figuratively die. He literally dies. And the reason you and I aren't plucking out eyes and cutting off hands is because he was cut off, because he was plucked, right? There's something about that. Anyways, just to say these things, right? So we tend to make these things tolerable by ignoring them. We don't struggle with them, not because like Matt, we take the Bible so seriously, it's because we just don't know what to do with how they fit with the American dream. So, feeling that weight, I want to think about, for this section, three things. I want to think about the many needs, the many needs in terms of God's commands, and then ask the question, are there many messiahs, and then bring it together in terms of the one body of Christ. So, let's think about the many needs. So, in terms of, uh, I don't know what your church experience is like, 
But uh, in my church, we have, our, our Sunday schools are pretty robust. And one of the things that we do at our church is we will often in Sunday school bring in partners that are involved in different vibrant ministries, right? So I, I remember having one of those come visit us and the guy there, he was involved with the local prison ministry and he was telling these amazing stories about his life and about what God is doing in the prison. And at the end of his time, there was this brown clipboard with a white ruled you know, piece of paper on it and it got handed around and, he, and it, the question was, there are different ways to help. You could help financially. You could sign up to be a mentor. There is actually a way to go there. You could, or you could do correspondence or that. And as that clipboard went around, I'm thinking, I felt convicted. And, you know, is it what I had for breakfast or is it the spirit? I don't know. It was powerful. Right? A few weeks later, we had someone come from a local housing project where there were Christians involved living there and doing some work, but there were, there were these pockets of shalom that were showing up and that God was doing this work that was pretty powerful, but the needs were real and there it needs for prayer, it needs for presence, these kind of things. And so at the end, the same clipboard got passed around. Different colored line sheet, right? What, what do you do? And then you can, you see where this is going, right? Then we have the annual missions conference and that year it was to India and there was wonderful work that God was doing among the, the financially uh, elite and politically elite in India, and there was some work among the materially poor there, and there were all these opportunities, and, and what should we do? And then there's the unplanned pregnancy center, and then there is the opportunity to help those uh, who are materially poor learn to read. You get what's going on. I'll stop. And at this point, you're probably familiar with the idea of compassion fatigue. Compassion fatigue. People are always needed to serve inside and outside of the church. I mean, when was the last time all of the legitimate needs were met? Right? When was the last time at church you're like, I think we've crushed it. We've done everything. There's nothing more to do. It's great. Right? So if that's funny and we think, no, that's not exactly the case, here's the question. If there are legitimate needs... Should we just perpetually feel guilty? Is that what we're supposed to feel? Is it like there are all these needs? How are we supposed to navigate this? In response to the endless needs and compassion fatigue, I have seen many in the church, particularly in in the conservative evangelical church, say, you know what, it's too much. We just need to quote, focus on what the Bible requires, unquote. Right? You're talking about too many needs. Let's just focus on what the Bible requires. And normally, that ends up being very specific things, primarily preaching and evangelism that make the short list. Worried that the church has too many programs, we often hear things like, let's just simplify and be like the early church. Now, if you know my work at all, I'm quite sympathetic. I'm strongly sympathetic with us trying to help overextended Christians. And I don't think the church should do everything. But I am worried that when that kind of talk surfaces, I now, maybe it's my cynical side, I now am pretty suspicious. I think behind them are are too often unbiblical assumptions behind this very narrow call of what the actual concerns in the church must be. Because when you look in the New Testament, and then you look at the church right after the New Testament, Christians did not just preach and pray, although those were absolutely central. They also shared their goods. They cared for widows. They comforted the grieving. They strengthened the poor. They testified the good news to their neighbors, they modeled a different way of existence in the world. In particular, through the bread and the wine, the church uniquely offers a taste of shalom that could break through the chaos and sin in a hungry and hurting world. So we must never forget, and this is where I think it gets complicated, we must never forget that we worship a king and we participate in a kingdom. 
And that means, and this is scary to even say it in, the, in our day, but that means that the gospel is inherently political. It is inherently social. It is political. We worship a king. It is social. It's about a kingdom. The question is, what, that, that's not the same thing as talking about a political party. Whichever party that is that comes to mind. We're part of a kingdom in which people from all tribes, tongues, skin colors, and cultures come together to worship the living God. So prejudices and racial and class blind spots that hinder such unity and purpose require us as the children of God to repent and actively seek to make things right. Think of Zacchaeus, who seeks to make right his gain from a system that oppress the disempowered. Remember Proverbs that says, in Proverbs 31, speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. How important and central is reconciliation between groups, for example, in Paul's proclaimed gospel? Bringing Jew and Gentile ethnic reconciliation, bringing slave and free economic reconciliation, bringing male and female, bringing reconciliation between the sexes, bringing them together. And in these settings and in this call of reconciliation in the church, power, those in normal positions of power are not to be presumptuous. The gospel often, as you know, subverts expectations. Worldly power structures Ignorance and abuse are not to be cultivated in the church. This is one of the reasons why you know it's so devastating when ministers abuse people, whether it's emotionally, sexually, physically. It's, it, it, it is much more devastating than, I'm not undermining just regular abuse, but it carries with it an exponentially worse uh, gravity to it because it's gotten complicated in terms of how we imagine God thinks of us and what his people should be like. Think about even in their earliest, one of the earliest bishops in the church is Onesimus. Whether or not it's the biblical one, there's some debate. But he was a slave. And all of a sudden, within the structure of the church, there are those who are under his authority that in the world, they are in no way under his authority. Concerns about God's will on earth, that, that his will on earth will more clearly echo the harmony of heaven that's actually a gospel issue. It's central to Christian mission and to the church. And when we don't think of daily bread as difficult to come by for some, if we, if we forget that the accumulation of debts, we act as if there's no spiritual import to that. If we are tempted to believe that we can hold grudges against individuals or whole groups without consequence, then we tend to cut ourselves off from God and the many people he cares about. What am I, where am I going with this? We'll see that the church is central to Christian discipleship. And the normal means by which God extends his presence and his love and his grace in his world is through the church. Therefore, the church faces countless needs, legitimate needs. And while American evangelical churches may be tempted to think the above list is, has too many, quote, social concerns, as many of you know, the global and historic churches found that to be a false dichotomy. Word and deed, love and justice, forgiveness and reconciliation, spiritual and material, future hope and present relief, these are meant to go together rather than be opposed. That's the path of Christian discipleship. And as you know, the normal way God extends his love, I mean, he can do whatever he wants, but his normal pattern to extend his love, provision, and priorities is through the people who make up his church. When God wants to be a refuge to people, it often comes through the church. When God wants to bring a word of grace to give a safe hug, to provide a warm meal, it often comes in some way of extension through the people of God. And even when the church can't and shouldn't do everything, it does seek through the people to foster the common good. 
So why do I say all of that? Given all the legitimate needs and call on God's people, we are faced with this question. What am I to do? What am I to do? What am I to do when the sign-up sheet comes around? When meaningful opportunities arise? Central to all of the church's work, whether it's feeding people, clothing people, praying with people, caring for widows, central to all of that work is a desire that people would be drawn continually back to the Messiah. Because he alone reveals the love, fully reveals the love of the Father as he pours out his spirit. And so human healing and hope cannot ultimately be restored apart from being reconciled with the Creator and Redeemer. We want to help to draw people into the embrace of the triune God. But the church is never meant to be a replacement for him. Simply put, all the gifts ultimately point back to the true giver. So this brings us to the question, many messiahs? How do we think about this? One of the challenges throughout the history of the church is that when individual Christians imagine that I must personally reflect the fullness of Jesus the Messiah. Whether it's certain ancient zealots, contemporary passionate pastors, or even some social activists, the individual imagines, often without realizing it, that they must personally embody the messianic expectations. And I actually think this has gotten much more intense in the modern Western world because of our stress on individualism and personal responsibility. And those things can be good things that can turn into bad things, right? There is truth in those instincts of, of individual faith and personal resp responsibility. But if you're not, if you don't make certain adjustments, it will take us in problematic directions. Such well-meaning inclinations often demonstrate, and I'll mention these without unpacking them, often demonstrate how we underestimate the uniqueness of the person and work of Christ. Underestimate the uniqueness of the person and work of Christ. But secondly, and I think we're, don't, we're more familiar with the first, but secondly, it tends to show how we overestimate God's expectation for each finite human being. As the Messiah, Jesus gave sight to the blind. He helped the lame to walk. He healed the leper. He opened the ears of the deaf. He raised the dead. He preached good news to the poor. He's fulfilling these messianic expectations of God as God visited his people uniquely through the anointed one. Having ushered in the kingdom of God, believers are to follow the very example of Jesus, being willing to sacrificially offer themselves for others on behalf of others, reflecting his patience, love, and his concern for the world. Listen, without question, Jesus was truly and fully human. Still is, that's an interesting conversation. But also had a unique calling as the one filled with the Spirit beyond measure, Jesus as the very embodiment of Israel, who faithfully loved God and neighbor with a depth and a consequence beyond measure. So where does this leave us? Are we all supposed to be messiahs? And I think what we find very often in our churches and maybe in our own hearts is this pull, there, it, as if only two options are there. One is the pull to do everything. We read about the sheep and the goats. Are you not going to take it seriously? So you got to do it all. And the other, which I find quite often, is to say, no, 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 we don't need to do anything because of the blood of Jesus. We've got to think through this. Are the only options do nothing? Or do everything. <clears throat> You're clever. You know there might be some other ways to think about it, right? So you go back to the sheep and the goats. Do you dismiss the story? Is that what we're meant to do? Or are you crushed by it? 
So I want to think about the one body of Christ. As you know, the whole church is called the body of Christ. For example, 1 Corinthians 12. I haven't been citing texts. They're, they're in here or whatever. But notice the whole church is the body of Christ, not as isolated people but as a united organism, the way Paul puts it in Romans 12. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, individually members of one another. And even though you know this, here's the punchline I want to make sure we all get. The whole church, the whole church is required to be the one body of Christ. The whole church is required to make the one body of Christ. The body that's composed of great diversity and difference with each dependent not only upon Christ, but dependent upon one another. And when we lose that idea that it takes the whole church to be the one body of Christ, we end up easily crushed and misunderstanding and misapplying these things. But when a healthy recognition of the Spirit's life-giving power in the church is understood in more communal ways, we're liberated to reimagine life together, what it should look like as God's people. The church is meant to be this Eden-like oasis amid this fractured world, pointing toward a time when shalom will again reign unhindered pointing back and pointing forward. No one person is meant to be or to do everything. But as the whole body of Christ, even in this broken world, we can reflect the beauty of the Savior. And we start to understand that we could be sheep even if we don't do everything. Let me put it to you differently. You can be a sheep even if you've not personally visited a prisoner. But don't imagine that means visiting prisoners is unnecessary. you got to do the whole thing. Because what ends up happening is we either think, I personally must visit prisoners, or visiting prisoners is not necessary for Christians. And neither of those is sufficient. If there is no heart, if there's no concern that the church is in some ways attending to all of these biblical concerns, and they are biblical, then we have to ask ourselves serious and sobering questions. So, it's a lot of talk. Let me tell you, let me get back to Matt. What did I, what did I tell Matt? Well, I'll, I'll tell Matt, I told Matt what I tell myself, and I'll tell you. Well, let me, let me, let me put it this way. Let me tell you about my last week. In the last 10 days... Here's what I've done. I have been involved evangelizing the disenfranchised in Nepal. I have prayed at the bedside of children with leukemia. I have helped fly cancer patients in a small airplane to a hospital that had the resources they needed because it wasn't in town. I have helped recovering sex traffic. Do you hate me yet? Do you know what I'm doing? Do you think I did all of those things? Yes. Yes. I did. Because by the Spirit, I am united to Christ and his people. And I had brothers and sisters who were in Nepal doing just that. And I just met a pilot, a Christian who does that, flying Christian or not. And there are Christians who are helping recovering sex trafficked victims. And there are, I am involved in racial reconciliation, not because I personally did all of those things in the last week, but because I am part of the body of Christ. And so we delight in one another. And the fact is, like, who's speaking to you right now? Kelly or Kelly's mouth? Isn't that weird? Like I never thought of it, right? Who's waving at you right now, right? You say Kelly is, because it's a body. You don't say the hand is waving. It's, it's the body. We do these things. I am not the body. 
but I am part of it. I am not the Messiah, and neither are you. Whether you're a pastor or not. But together, resting in the finished work of Christ, empowered by the life-giving Spirit, together we can and do carry out the Father's compassion and love by participating in his holy work. But we do this as the body of Christ. We are sheep because the shepherd has loved us. And we together follow and imitate him. We are disciples. Let me close this section with a, pray- with a bit of a prayer from John Bailey. Some of you know the Scottish theologian and pastor John Bailey, end of the 19th, early 20th century. He captures this spirit in this part of a larger prayer. Here's what he prays. O Lord of the vineyard, I beg thy blessing upon all who truly desire to serve thee by being diligent and faithful in their several callings bearing their due share of the world's burden and going about their daily tasks in all simplicity and uprightness of heart. You see, Bailey understood that God normally works in his world through his people, but he works by employing all of his people with their various gifts and calling. But notice... No individual is to carry the weight of the world. It would crush any and all of us, and we know that because it crushes Christ on the cross. But thanks be to God, he doesn't just get crushed, he rises. No, each believer following the Messiah is to bear their due share of the world's burden, because it takes all of us to represent the one crucified and risen Christ. We do not need to be ashamed of our smallness, of our limits. Only when we accept our finitude and affirm our interdependence as the people of God, only then can we move from guilt to liberty, from being overwhelmed to energized, from passivity to activity. God never expected us as individual disciples to do everything. He's the one who gave you a spouse. He's the one who gave you a job that takes time. He's the one who gave you children that you need to spend time with and love and feed. He gave you a body. He knows your limits. He knows the obligations on you. He also uniquely gifted and called each of us to some form of sacrificial service and love. Only Jesus is his whole body. Only he is the Messiah. The rest of us don't have to be him. We just have to be in him by the Spirit, united to one another as his body. That is trying to help us think through the importance of the church. Um, I was thinking about the ancient, um, and you know, John Owen, John Calvin actually quote this as well, and there's some, but the ancient saying, there's no salvation outside of the church. There's a, there's a way to tease that out, and I understand the potential landmines here, but I hope, I hope you're hearing this in, in a generous kind of way. All right, let me spend just a, a, a couple minutes now thinking through this idea then. How do we think of discipleship in light of the larger idea of finitude, the larger idea um, that I'm, that's kind of in the book, You're Only Human. And I'm toying with this idea of go therefore and make humans. Which I know sounds like, let's make babies or something. So <laughs> we just put it there. It's not, it's not what I mean, although I'm not against that. And biblically, that is part of the deal, just so you know. But um, no, that's not what this talk is, is actually like. So what does Christian discipleship look like? What does it sound like? What are its rhythms? What are its purposes? What are its pleasures? Is discipleship primarily about increasing knowledge and stirring up activity? Is it otherworldly or is it deeply thisworldly? I think we need to avoid false dichotomies here. We need to hold together together 
knowledge and action, labor and rest, lament and laughter. Maybe we can stop. I've been going around asking people when they hear the word discipleship, what do they think, and trying to gather information. What have been their experiences in the church of discipleship? What does it look like? And that's informing some of what I'll say here. But maybe part of what needs to happen is we need to stop thinking and seeing Christian discipleship as a program or even as a set of ideas and more as a way of life, a way of life that's both heavenly and earthly, both present and future. Because when we fail to keep that kind of dynamic, it malforms us as Christians, often fostering unrealistic and unhealthy expectations about what discipleship is or should look like. For example, on the one hand, Christians can smuggle in expectations about the endless special things a real disciple will do. And we're particularly vulnerable for that if, if you're an academic, if you're a seminary student, you're going, we tend to think, hey, you know what discipleship is? Read these hundreds of pages. Right? We tend to think about how much you will read, all the events you will attend if you're a real disciple, the powerful influence you might achieve. That's on the one hand in terms of smuggling in some problematic expectations, but on the other hand, discipleship is often reduced to evangelism, merely trying to convert people to Christ. And once they're converted, we're not actually sure what to do with them. This is not as much of a problem in evangelicalism as it was 40 years ago, but it remains a problem where the whole goal of being a disciple is to convert people, and their whole goal in life is to convert people, but everything between your conversion and glory is basically try and make converts and try not to do really bad sins. But in terms of life, it's kind of like as one of my colleagues, Brian Fickert is an economist, he and I wrote something on this, and he said it's kind of like being in a doctor's office where you're waiting and there's People Magazine, you don't care about People Magazine, you never read People Magazine, but you're like, I got nothing to do in the next half an hour, and you find yourself reading People Magazine. That's actually what's happening in most of our churches. People know it was important to get converted and know something important is going to happen, but in the meantime, we're in the doctor's office waiting, so let's just read People Magazine. That's a failure to understand what we're getting at with discipleship. I can't unpack all of these, but three of the main challenges I, I'm gathering in terms of discipleship is one, overly narrow and reductionistic accounts of discipleship. And one of those overly narrow reductionistic accounts is discipleship's just about converting people. That's too narrow, too small. A second one, though, which is massive, but I had to cut out all the reflections on that. It's not just outside the church, it's inside the church. The second is assumptions about self-actualization. That we now understand the self and an individual as about becoming self-actualized, which is primarily about your internal world. And that's a massive challenge to biblical understandings of discipleship. And number three is this level of busyness and unhealthy expectations. I think our busyness and unhealthy expectations is a massive challenge to discipleship. So, with that in mind, whatever Christian discipleship is, it must be relevant for all Christians at all times. It must apply to the person who's caring for their aging parent as well as to the exhausted parents of a newborn. Discipleship must resonate with the literate and the illiterate, with the materially poor and the stunningly wealthy, male and female, business owner and school teacher, nurse and prison guard, all believers as followers of Jesus. So how does this idea of discipleship reach all of us, not just, and we've got to say this, this is a grad school here, not just the brightest or those with the most free time or power or freedom. My proposal for Christian discipleship is not a brand new idea. I simply want to help us to remember what we often assume but then ignore. 
and I hope we will recognize then and cherish it instead. I think the heart and task of Christian discipleship is about making humans. Again, I don't mean babies here, simply. What I mean is, in our dehumanizing world, Christian discipleship must both point back to the goodness of creation and forward to the eschatological promises of God. Eastern Orthodox theologian John Anthony McGaughlin observes, listen to what he said, this is exactly my view. He said, the real problem today is not that men and women have become secularized, non-religious or whatever, not that men and women who have become secularized, non-religious or whatever, have lost their sense of God. The real problem isn't they've lost their sense of God. The problem is that they have lost their sense of what it is to be truly human. Lost their sense of what it is to be truly human. I think that's my contention as well. It's not just a problem outside of the church, it's infected the church. And when we don't appreciate some of this, because we don't have a rich view of the goodness of human creatures, right? I know, you know, I'm reformed. We believe in creation, fall, redemption, consummation. But actually what we believe in is creation, you know, creation, fall, redemption, consummation. Everyone claims we believe in the goodness of creation. But we're really not sure it has any continuing relevance. We need to rediscover this. At the best, at its best, the Christian life, the life of discipleship, is a truly human life. It's not something other than that. So are you enough? The heart of being fully human. Have you ever heard this? Don't worry. You are enough. You are enough. Those words are fairly popular in our day. They're repeated on TV shows and in bumper stickers. You are enough. They may be uttered by a compassionate parent to a hurting child who's aware that others in school are better students or better at sports than they are. Sometimes a tender-hearted spouse might say this to their, their husband who's swallowed up with insecurities. Or a counselor might offer a vision of this sentiment to the struggling client who feels like their parents were always disappointed in her. So they're given the assurance, you are enough. But what if that isn't exactly true? What if I am not enough? And who can judge when enough is? What at first can be a healing tonic can unintentionally foster a new sickness? What if our creaturely finitude the goodness of our creaturely finitude teaches us the opposite. What if it teaches us we were never enough? Which, by the way, is exactly why you are enough. And a generous understanding of that to the Christian counselor or whatever, when they say you are enough, that actually is what they mean. They mean you were never meant to be more than you are. You're not enough. That's the only reason you are enough. You were never meant to be enough. You get the idea. You and I were made for healthy dependence, not isolated or victorious autonomy. You and I were always made to need God, need others, and to need the rest of creation. This trifled truth of human creaturely need is fundamental to being human. And what if, in light of the cosmic, social, and personal problem of sin, what if Christian discipleship is essentially about how the Spirit renews and reshapes us in the image of Christ, the full and true human? Well, might we better imagine discipleship as inviting people into the life of faith and repentance, helping them become human through cultivating right loves, healthy dependence on God, neighbor, and creation? Creaturely limits and dependence are not the result of the fall. God made us to be dependent on God, to be dependent on neighbor, and to be dependent on the earth. That's not part of the fall. That's part of the good way God made us. And as Bonhoeffer says, sin is not what made us dependent. Sin is what twists all of those dependencies. It distorts those dependencies. 
right? We now tend to envision the goal of life as growing more and more independent. We should increase our productivity, increase our efficiency, and hopefully end up in radical autonomy. How in the world can Christians, can you disciple people in a world where if I say, you know, uh, Kayla, I spent some time with Kayla, and guys, do you know, like, she's like super dependent on a lot of people. Does that sound like a compliment in our culture? When does it ever sound like a compliment to say someone is dependent on others? So how in the world can you disciple them? If fundamental to being a human creature, a good human creature, is dependence on God, neighbor, and earth, and we think that's a bad thing, even in the church, do you see the struggle we're against? It's massive. We just had, um, we just had uh, Easter, as many of you know, and depending on your tradition, some of you will be familiar with what are sometimes called the three Lenten pillars. Prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. I only mention those in passing because notice, notice that. Prayer is about relationship with God. Fasting is about renewing that relationship with creation and being mindful of your dependence on creation. Almsgiving is about reconnecting you with others. And by the way, I think there's a relationship with self here. I just wouldn't have to unpack it. What you find, well... You can ask me about the self later, if you, if you care. Um, discipleship must have something to do with following Christ, but it can't be detached. I mean, it has everything to do with following Christ, but it can't be detached from the foundation of a good creation. And what happens is so often we detach discipleship from our doctrines of creation. And when you detach it from creation, we are all the more at risk of distortion and trendiness in our views of discipleship. So, here's my working thesis. True discipleship in our world must be both Christ-centered and human-affirming. It's the joyful life of repentance and faith that is meant to be holistic and hopeful, sacrificial and realistic, humble and confident, vertical and horizontal. Put differently, Christian discipleship is simply calling Christian discipleship is simply God calling us to the beauty and wonder of being human. Of recapturing the reality of healthy dependence. And when I say this, it may sound unchristian, even anti-spiritual. But I honestly think that's only because we've lost a biblical vision of being human. We bought into the lie that a right relationship with God is actually a bonus to being human rather than essential. So I just want to mention, as I near the end here, um, the work of Krista McCurland. She's done some really nice work here where she's drawing on the philosopher Garrett Thompson, who's not, not a Christian, and he develops the analytic philosophical idea of, of um, fundamental need and explores what is, qualifies as a fundamental need. It's, it's fascinating work. And McCurland, what she does is she lays out the concept of fundamental need, but exploring it from a theological perspective. So let me just tell you a little bit about this. The characteristics of a creature determine its needs, right? And when those needs are met, the creature flourishes. And when they are withheld, the creature is harmed. And understanding a creature's constitution then can help you better understand how it will flourish and seeing how it flourishes will help us better appreciate whatever its fundamental needs are. So, for example, a rose needs sunlight to flourish because it's a plant. A whale needs plankton to flourish because of the kind of animal it is. And the argument she makes, which I think is right, is that the distinctive fundamental need of humans is the need of having, quote, a second personal relation to God. We might call it communion with God. It's a fundamental need. It's not a bonus. It's not like, you, you're, you're awesome, be human, and it'd be great if you also kind of related to God. This need, as she says, is a passive disposition. It's required for full human flourishing. And what's interesting about, philosophically, about the idea of a fundamental need, 
is it's there whether or not you currently have it, right? In other words, a dog has a need for water. The fact that a dog is drinking water doesn't change the fact that the dog's fundamental need is for water. Whether you have the water or you don't have the water, it, that is a fundamental need. By definition, fundamental need denotes neither lack nor fulfillment, just dependence. It doesn't tell you if it's a lack or a fulfillment, it just says this is what you have. And humans, as she would say, have a disposition, a non-mental property to relate to God, second personally. Our flourishing is not static, like a fundamental need. But the two are related. Flourishing and fundamental need are not the exact same. We flourish to the degree that our fundamental need or needs are met. It is possible to suffer harm when a fundamental need is not met, even if you're currently unaware of that need. Many creatures need food, water, and oxygen, but humans made in the image of God are distinct and that they alone appear to need this second personal relation to God. All creatures have some kind of relation to God, but there's something distinctive here. And when this need is withheld or lacking, the human creature is impoverished, whereas the qualitative and quantitative increase in that relation results in a more fully human experience. Now, I would just add at the end to McCurlin that I think we do have the fundamental need for God, but also fundamental need for humans is human to human relation and a profound deep need for the rest of creation. And that these relations with God, neighbor, and creation also impact our self. The self is not merely constructed by looking inwardly, but inevitably is related to external relations. From a Christian perspective, those three key relations are God, neighbor, and creation, and how those relations develop impact how we, in a sense, relate even to ourselves. So at the end, when discipleship and flourishing are not kept together, it is often a sign that we are now downplaying the guiding principle that the creator is also the redeemer and sanctifier. And then when that happens, it can be very difficult for us to connect the dots between death and life, between sacrifice and generosity, between the individual and the community, between the human and the divine. So let us never forget the full human flourishing in the biblical sense of shalom encompasses God, neighbor, and the rest of creation. It doesn't pit them against one another. Although Yahweh is clearly the center that shapes the right relations with the other two. And thanks to the firstborn from the dead and the power of the spirit of the risen Christ, we are pointed both back to God's good creation and forward to the telos of humanity. Joyful and unhindered, communion with the triune God enjoyed as we feast with one another and experience the full harmony with the rest of creation. Christian discipleship is preparing us for that reality. Thank you. Let's have a discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Capic. That was splendid. Um, there's no way you could know this, but I had a son a month and a half ago. Oh. And I thought, I saw the title of your talk, and I thought, oh, there's no conviction in, there, in this talk for me. I've done my part, you know? <laughs> Little did I know that there would be plenty of conviction for me. <laughs> that was, it was really good. Uh, you you so, made a human, so you're good. I, you're I good made to a go. human. Box, box <laughs> ticked. Um, but so we, I wanted to ask, a, to get the, thing, the ball rolling, I wanted to ask a question that also has to do with my son. So we're baptizing my son this Sunday. Mm. And your talk made me think of another baptism. And it's a baptism that occurred at the end of the first Godfather movie. I don't know if you... Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to remember. So it, it, I'll set the scene. So Michael Corleone is like ascending to power. And the final scene in The Godfather, he's baptizing his son in the church. And it, the, the movie ends with cut scenes from his son being baptized to him, to like execution of orders that he made to pop off all his enemies. Right? So it's this gruesome scene juxtaposed with this scene of baptism. And... It, 
testifies in some ways to, I think, to a lingering question I have with respect to your ecclesial vision, which I find so persuasive. And it's a question that uh, folks like Willie Jennings and Lauren Winner have asked, like, if the church is given this responsibility to be this you know, united witness to the work of Christ in the world, what can we do when what we seem to see is persistent failure of the church to do so? And I was wondering if you have any recommendations as far as practices or things to be aware of so that the church can actually perform its task well. Because um, in my mind, I want the church to be what you say it is. Yeah. And then I'm like, oh, I just don't seem to see it as much as I'd like to. You know? oh, that's, that's, a, that's a fantastic question, actually. And something I wrestle with. Uh, so, um, yeah, L Lauren's book, um, if you don't know, she, she has this book basically on Christian practices. And she's good friends with Stanley Hauerwas and stuff. But in some ways, you know, Stan Hauerwas, if you know the vision, is basically like, uh, th these practices shape us and that this is such a good thing. Da -da -da. And she, she's finally like, I don't know. I know a lot of people who do practices and they're wicked, right? And so she starts to tell these stories in the book about like a slave owner who prays all the time, good Southern, quote unquote, godly woman, it's just wicked. And so what do you deal with that, right? Some of the, those kind of things. Um, and, and so I do think that's, and I, so I would say a couple things on that. Um, and, and the Jennings work also similarly, right? So one thing I would say is because the body of Christ is a reality, that is why these things are so problematic. Like they, it is why it almost increases the weight and heinousness of them, right? And part of it obviously is we live in the now, not yet, and there's not... Um, you know, it's the Donatist controversy, right? We're, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna find that perfect church. Um, but well, part of what I would say is, let me use those cases. So, so in the beginning of Willie Jennings, some of you know his book on Christian imagination, and he starts by telling the story about being a young boy in, I guess it's Grand Rapids, or it's right near it. And his mom and dad, his, I think his dad's a preacher, his mom basically, you know, like these are pillars in the black church there. And basically one summer afternoon, if I remember right, they're, they're outside, the mom's outside, he's outside as a kid, I don't think the dad's there, maybe. He, and anyways, but a, a bunch of tall Dutch Christians come trying to evangelize them. And how painful it was, first of all, the assumption was that they weren't Christians, that, that these people had nothing to offer, and that they didn't need to be known. Well, part of what I think is fascinating is that's an example where the church, and I think the same thing fits with winter, the church is impoverished when you're not listening and learning from the, the whole body. And so sometimes people are like, well, how are you going to learn from the global church we're here? They were neighbors. They were just different. And part of, what, part of what is strangely happening with this increase of media and all of that, I think counterintuitively where originally the vision was everyone's going to be united, what's actually happened is greater fragmentation, including in the church. So all, that's a long-winded way of saying... Um, for, for the ecclesial vision to be followed, it needs to constantly be this movement between the universal and the local church. And, you know, we have someone here working on a dissertation on denominational unity and the lack of it and what does that look like in terms of God. And, and I think that's a live question. Um, but I guess I would just say, yeah, you're right to ask it. And... Sometimes what's happening is, I mean, think about what that does to people's perception of the church. But what I've, uh, the last thing I will say on this, though, is because of all of the abuse, what I see a lot, I see this in alum from my college, but all over, is people have said, 
look at pastors. I've seen so many hypocrites. I've seen this thing blow up. People have ignored this sexual abuse or this, that, and that. So they're trying to be Christians and they're very angry or disillusioned with the church. And part of my using this text as an example is it's easy to belittle the church. But if you take the gospel seriously without the church, you're in huge trouble. So how do we value the church without romanticizing the church? Yeah. That's what I'm trying to figure out. Yeah. I don't have the answer. But that's what, yeah. I want us to value it, yeah. but not lie about it. Yeah. I think Stanley Howard is fascinating, because if I'm honest, like, I wish I never read his biography. It's not a biography. <laughs> I'm like, the guy, the guy likes, likes to talk about the church, but for a lot of his life, I didn't think he was that involved in the church. And so I'm not, that, that, that's a problem for me, right? So. Oh, that's incredibly helpful. Thank you. Uh, I welcome you to come to the microphones to ask Dr. Kapik your questions. There is a microphone over there. There's a microphone over there. Uh, yeah, come on up. Thanks. I'm a local pastor, I preach every week, and I always try to include indicatives of Christ's completed work, but Christ also wants me to command everybody to observe and do everything he said. So my question is to sort of help with that. One thing that stuck with me from your book that I really appreciated, you talked about how when we ask people to love God, we're not asking them to sort of rub two sticks together and generate love, because God is love, that, that's, that there's a relationship to it. But I don't wanna skip out on commanding my people to, to live differently. Uh, so maybe to help unpack that a little bit. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, Should I do something bad? <laughs> bad first answer, maybe. So is this on? There we go. OK. Um, that's a great question. So one of the things I, I let me kind of be theological here for a second in, in terms of one of the things I've seen happen, let me describe a common sermon, and you guys tell me if this sounds familiar. The sermon is you read the text, and then you unpack the text, and the text is whatever God commands or you know, what, what life should look like, what you should do, the command. And then the next part of the sermon is we can't do it. We failed. And then the next part of the sermon is, but don't worry, Jesus did it. Pray, bye. <laughs> now, this is very tricky what I'm about to say because I don't actually think that sermon's a bad thing. I think every move there, in a sense, is true. But in another sense, it's an incomplete sermon. And I recognize there are landmines everywhere, but here's how I would put it. I, I think, and this happens a lot in evangelical land, is that we have reduced the gospel to cross. So it is true, you and I failed, you just named the commandment, and it is true that Christ was the faithful one who lived the life and died the death for us. Praise God. But Christ did not just die, he rose. And Part of the good news is not just Christ died, but he rose that we would live in him a resurrection life. And so not just it was I crucified with Christ, but the life I now live, I live by faith. And that's a way of saying there's good work for us to do. It's never been about not doing good work. It's just obviously about not confusing that good work for thinking that your relationship with God is dependent on that or something like that, his acceptance. But I think what happens is when we stop the sermon and you're, you failed, Jesus did it, have a good week, that is so helpful at first. But after a number of years, I, and I've seen this again and again, at some point people are like, I think my life is irrelevant. If I read the Bible, if I don't read the Bible, it doesn't matter. If I help the old woman get across the street and I don't help though, it doesn't really matter. Like there's no sense of mission. There's no sense of like, I get to participate in the love of God. I'm not generating it, I'm not making it, but God's love is moving and he calls me through the resurrected life of Christ in the power of the spirit to participate. Not to make myself right with God, but because I am right with God. So anyways, I do think that's a fascinating thing where it's like, 
We don't have to apologize to call people to life. And I, I'm worried that we've pitted cross against resurrection. And I would actually make the same criticism in some of our churches that are all about social activism and everyone's exhausted and they don't understand, no, 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 it is finished. You can rest in the work of Christ. They're just different mistakes. But we tend to pick between those rather than like, how do we, how do, we do that? And I'm not saying every sermon has to do it all, but over the normal pattern, we should be cross-resurrection people. Thank you so much. I really appreciated your talk. Um, you mentioned the book you co-wrote with Brian Fickard, but you didn't mention the title. Thank you for modeling dependence by allowing me to say the title of the book is Becoming Whole, and it's excellent, and you should all read it. Um, I have a hot take on your talk, and you uh -oh. can, I'm gonna toss it at you, you can bat it away if you want. Okay. Um, but I kept thinking throughout your talk of Bonhoeffer's Cost of Discipleship. And the thing everybody remembers from that book is Bonhoeffer says the Protestants were so enthusiastic to guard justification by faith alone that they separated justification from sanctification. To avoid making a wrong connection, they disconnected it. And the solution is to reconnect them, but connect them in the right way. Another thing he says that's very important for him, but is not as widely remembered, he says the Protestants were so enthusiastic for the doctrine of vocation that Christians have a calling from God in everything that they do, that the Protestant reformers, or, the, 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 or there's those who followed them, disconnected that from ecclesiology. They, they wanted you to know you have a calling from God while you're driving a truck working for a secular truck company, while you're writing a report in a cubicle working for a secular company. So the doctrine of your calling from God got disconnected from your membership in the body of Christ. My hot take is that you mentioned in the prayer that you quoted uh, that we're all bearing our part of the burden as we follow our several callings. And then when you elucidated that prayer, you were using that language of following our callings. I just wanted to ask you to kind of reflect on reconnecting the doctrine of vocation to ecclesiology because it seems to me it's something you're implicitly doing. Oh, thank you. I'll pay you later. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, and I love that you brought up the cost of discipleship. I mean, one of the things that's fascinating that Bonhoeffer does there is he warns, you'll remember, he warns about what he calls the monastic mistake, which is kind of getting at what you're, you're saying. And, and so the idea is, if you're really serious about God, then you, you retreat into this little thing, which is fascinating that he warns about this monastic mistake, since some people take his, life, his book, Life Together, to try and potentially recreate what he thinks is a monastic mistake. Uh, his point is, life together really matters, justification by faith alone matters, but that is a life to be lived in community, in all of these callings, not just ecclesial. And, one, and so he really does think this cost of discipleship, I mean, I, I would put it, I, I, I reread that in preparation for this book, kind of thinking through this very thing. Um, and I, I do think he's talking about, there's a way to read Bonhoeffer where he really is talking about the importance of affirming our full humanity. Now, as you know, most of that, text is actually him doing a commentary on the Sermon on the Mount. And he does say radical things there. And, and I, he's trying to you know, think through God's commands. And I think it sounds weird to say, you're human affirming even as you're calling people to die and to sacrifice. Um, but, and, and this is interesting, like Charles Taylor at the beginning of his um, volume on the secular age, he's talking about all this stuff on human flourishing, and then he kind of has this aside about like, well, Christians don't exactly fit this, because you can flourish while you're suffering, which is fascinating in light of all of the talk about, you know, and I'm interested, I'm involved in the positive psych, all that kind of stuff, but... There's a wrinkle there if you're a Christian, because we can somehow flourish even in suffering. And, and so, um, but all, all that to say, no, I do think you're right. I, and I think we've, we, I feel like we solved the previous generation's problem that said, if you're really a Christian, you're going to be a missionary or a pastor. I don't see that as much, but I don't see the strong affirmation of vocation no matter what it is. And I st so I think actually what happened is like, yeah, you don't need to be a pastor. You don't need to be a missionary. And God doesn't really care what you're doing. And that's not, 
that's still not, that's just a different problem. Yeah. But thank you very much for your lecture. I have two questions. Uh, the first one, so the three components that you mentioned about discipleship with God, others, and creation. So do we ever attain full discipleship? Um, or do you consider it as an ongoing process? Uh, the second question somehow connects with the first. I, I love the way you paint uh, the picture of the body of Christ and how each person is doing one thing or the other. Uh, it, it kind of reminds me of that idea of uh, everyone gets a ring even if you play just one game uh, at the end of uh, when, you, when you win a championship. So how do we create a balance uh, between just they are doing it and so I don't have to be involved, uh, so that we, we ensure that in some way, you're not just a fan who is supporting others doing it, but you're also in some way contributing to the team. <laughs> Hello? Oh yeah? It's me, it's me. I'm Matt. Anyways, I won't make any more. Okay, uh, great, great question. I mean, in a sense, I actually think we just are disciples. Um, who, If you're following Jesus, you're a disciple. But I do think there can, be, um, there can be a depth in that, right? There can be a growth in that kind of thing. Um, part, of, part of what we want to see, and this is kind of like with, with shalom or human flourishing, is that it's not a static, it's not like a picture on the wall of the family. It's actually like a movie, it's, it's ongoing, it's growing, it's, it's a dynamic image rather than a static one. Um, and so I do think in terms of our depth and understanding and experience of discipleship, if it's understood the way I'm talking about in terms of God, neighbor, and, and the rest of creation, I do think there can be a growth and appreciation or whatever that looks like. It doesn't necessarily have to be just purely cognitive though which would be interesting to explore. Um, but your, your second question about like how do, we, how do we honor one another but also not just become like watchers or fans. Um, there's, there's some pastors in the room here. Most, most if, I mean, let's be honest. If you're here, that means you care about ministry and you're a nerd. That's what the, those two things are required if you're here. Just so you know, it's midweek. You came to a theology lecture. Those two things are true of you. Sorry if that's self-revelation. But so my guess is all of you know this, and that means you're probably involved in your church. And one of the things that's just basically common almost every church is that 15 to 20 percent of the church does almost all the work of the church. And no one thinks that's a good thing. The challenge is how do you change that? Because that's part of what you're trying to get at. Like I, I remember I had a pastor who called wanted me to come to his church, but he said, listen, my wife said, you really, you need to invite Kelly to come talk to this session and talk to the church. And he told me, I told her, if Kelly comes, the session's going to stop working. Like, they're not going to do anything anymore, right? And he's trying to be funny, but, because the idea is, like, we should rest, we should have rhythm, we should do some of that. Well, one of the challenges is the reason 15% of people doing everything is because we're pretty sure if we don't, it's not going to get done. And one of the hard, and I don't have easy solutions for this, but one of the hard things is to go, well, first of all, does it all need to be done? And then second of all, do we really think God cares for these people more than we do? Because sometimes we hate a vacuum, but the problem is we constantly fill the vacuum from guilt or whatever, and there's never a vacuum for people to step into. Um, and, I, and I think about, I think about um, Moses' father-in-law, you know, Jethro. Jethro comes, it's a fascinating story, because everybody's coming to Moses, and when you actually read the story, we all know Jethro's like, dude, you're doing too much. But actually what it says is, the people are coming to Moses to find out God's opinion about certain things. So imagine being a pastor or a leader in your church, and people are coming to you to ask what God thinks about certain things. When are you ever going to not do that thing? But what's interesting is Jethro says what, and he seems to be echoing, I think the author is intentionally doing this, echoing the opening chapters of Genesis, where he says, it is not good you are alone. He's doing good things. 
And the question is, do you trust God to provide to do this thing even if it's not you? And I think that's super scary. I don't have great answers, but I think in the Spirit, we need to pray for creativity and ways to genuinely invite people in, but also to ask hard questions about, are we doing too much? What does that look like? How does this look? Um, and I do think our ecclesiology can say there's, there's ways in which our church is doing things even if it's because our people are involved in things that the church itself is not sponsoring. It can still be good work in the part of the, you know, for the common good. But that's not a great answer, but I, I, I think it's, we got to ask hard questions because we do need to call people, not out of guilt, but as an invitation. You know, how often have you seen where people are like, and this is often my own life, like, I don't want to go to that thing. I don't want to help out. And, you know, we've been involved in certain things. And then you go and you're like, that was so life-giving. And, you know, so I, I know there's no easy answers. It's incredibly hard to get people to do anything right now. But it's for their good. But it's also for the good of the people who are doing too much. you got to stop doing too much. I know it's easier said than done. Andy? I knew I was close. Okay, so... Um, <clears throat> Well, well, thank you so much um, for this compelling talk and, and compelling and persuasive thesis. I agree with Dr. Dovell. It's very persuasive. And, and it generated many thoughts in my own mind as, as you're going. And, and it also brought me back to 1999 and my undergrad days listening to Switchfoot and their song, <laughs> A New Way to Be Human, which, which you, you said you weren't bringing us something new. And, and so... Uh, it's not that you're saying something new, but you're drawing us to be challenged to to be old in the way that God taught us to be in the, in the scriptures. But I, I find it interesting that Switchfoot and an artist or in hymnity, mm. um, as as songwriters, can draw artistically on what it means to be human, creaturely, mm. finite, dependent on God, and then we come to places like this. Um, where we theologize or or seminaries, mm. and and I find this juxtaposition. I, I'm reading uh, Art and Faith by Mak Makoto Fujimura, mm. and the idea that the God, the artist, comes to us before God, the lecturer, mm. and, and this idea of brokenness um, is the space where the blessing that God can intersect mm. those places, and, and being human and, and creation and interdependence, and, and I'm, I'm wondering how do we fall short in the way we do seminary, in the way we do forming <laughs> of pastors, because then these pastors are the ones who form disciples or make humans, if we can even, if we can even do that as mm. people, as you were mentioning, it's God that does right. these works. Yeah. But are we falling short in ways because the hermeneuticizing task is something we do alone and the interpretation we do alone and we go and do our study alone and we, I know mm. I'm overgeneralizing, but we go to the library alone and, and then we come mm. back and we preach alone, and we, and we teach our people to learn alone, and then we wonder why we don't do interdependence, why mm. we don't interdependent on creation and others, and, and so what are some of the ways that, not, I mean, I'm being a little bit overt in, in answering that with the question, but what are some of the ways that we can correct that maybe in the way that we do formation in seminary, where, we, where we've turned the Bible yeah. into a technical book, where we've turned the project of theology into a scientific task, if we do this, 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 we can know God, as opposed to mm. some of the more art, artful ways that we can come to know God. Wow, that's such a, that's a very rich, good question. And if I could answer it well, I would be wealthy. <laughs> I can just tell you that seminaries, well-meaning, including this place, is just trying to figure that out. Because because most seminary presidents and administrators that I know and faculty actually agree with just about everything you said. Um, and so there's a genuine desire to figure out how do we, and there, there's a genuine, uh, pretty widely recognized, like, we just haven't done this super well. People are, are malformed. Um, I was... I met with some of the PhD students before this, and I was saying, you know, my experience, one of the challenges, since there's some seminary folks here, one of the challenges I've often seen is that you're in the church, you're, you're doing ministry, you know, and, and, and maybe you're 
leading a Sunday school, small group, whatever, and, and the church and the pastor, everyone's like, you know, I think God's given you gifts. You should th think about seminary. I think maybe God's called you and it's this beautiful thing. And it's like, oh, that's great. And your mentors and pastors were your model. And then you go to seminary and all of a sudden your model becomes a professor. Now I'm a professor, so I'm dissing myself here, but there's a challenge because then all of a sudden the professor becomes the model, and then what happens is then when you finally go back to the church, you try and make the church like a classroom rather than like where you originally started. And, and, it, and you can watch this again and again with new pastors where if they've got a good church, the church is gonna be patient, but the church is gonna work that out of them, right? <laughs> Because that's not good for anybody. Um, well, I mean, some churches love it because everyone who's not like intellectually wired in a certain way just leaves. But for most churches that have like the breadth of God's people, that, that's not. So I do think you're asking the right kind of questions. And there is, there is a reason why now seminary curriculums are talking about formation and counseling things and some of those things. But as you probably know, ask most pastors. I, I think the, theological, I'm a theologian, I think theological education it deeply matters. And we do need people doing careful work because if you just talk about formation apart from careful theology, you can just end up in very non-Christian places pretty quickly. So you need good theology and deep theology. It doesn't mean everybody has to do it. And seminary is primarily about shaping your instincts. It is not, because you already know, you don't even remember stuff from your first year, much less last semester, let's be honest. So you feel like, why am I at seminary? Well, because it's not about what you remember, it's your instincts are being shaped. Your loves are being shaped. That's what, that actually what matters, so that when you intuitively say, this doesn't feel right, you also know the kind of resources to go back to to help you. So we, we shape those. The question is, as seminaries help shape your intuitions in those ways, how might we as the church and institution help shape your other loves, help shape you emotionally? Someone brought up in the PhD uh, time with PhD students about you know, emotionally healthy churches and emotionally healthy pastors. Uh, that, is, that is worth us attending to. It really is. If you, if you end up with thoughts about like, hey, if you do the go make humans, here's something you should read, here's a quote to consider, here's where you're crazy and wrong, <laughs> any of those things, send an email, my email's online, I do value that kind of feedback, it's meaningful, so thank you. Well, to, uh, how much time do we have? Two minutes? Well, maybe uh, just to provide a bookend then, I've heard you, use a word repeatedly, and it's a word that's become really important to me as a professor, and it's a word that I imagine should be really important to people who are pastors, and I think it's a word that is maybe the sort of complementary other side of learning our dependence, which is trust. Um, and it, it came to mind when you were talking about going to that session and them saying, well, if Kelly comes, then the session's never gonna work again, because 15% of the people are doing all the work. Right. And part of that, part of when I hear that, I think like it's really hard to not be that way because it involves a, a certain kind of counterintuitive trust of the church. Uh, for me, it's been a counterintuitive trust of my students because mm. it's so much easier to like take things into our own control mm. and say that I am enough because I am me, mm. right? And then, so maybe what role does trust play in your project, in, in your ministry, and in your, maybe even your teaching? How do, how, do you, how do you see trust weaving together with dependence? Yeah, it's, it's, I think you're right. I think trust is huge, and it often does betray, do we trust God, do we trust others, and do we trust kind of creation here? Um, I mean, it's, it's fascinating. I'll, okay, so let's give you an example. Because uh, it is hard. It's hard not to think God needs me or needs you to do it all. But um, I have a student who's got just, is, she's dealt with a lot of challenges through life. And, um, and so she has a few people on campus that, will, that, that know the situation and will pray for her. 
And I was out of town this is last week, and I, I got an email. Or no, and so I was out of town, and um, I'm not sure why, but she came to mind in the middle of the day. And I just wrote her a little, little note, prayed for her. And she wrote back and said, I have been on the verge of a panic attack, and I went to the offices of the three people who know, and they're all gone. And then you prayed, sent a prayer, and, and, and then she, and she just said, that was very meaningful. I'm not saying this to be like heroic. I'm just telling you. And then, and then she told me that that night, out of nowhere, someone had, uh, that she didn't know had asked her to dog sit for their house. And she said, she told me this when I got back to campus. She said that night she ended up, a couple hours after our exchange, in a bed with five dogs all around her. <laughs> And she just was smiling, telling me how healing it was. And I think, that's beautiful. That's God, that's other people, and that's creation. But I had a very small part in that. And, but there is this sense of, like, I got to try, like, because I can't be that person's counselor. I can't be their, con I, I have a very small part. A lot of people, most people have bigger parts than that than I. But it is, like, the little things we get to participate in but it is trust, and it's also a trust when, like, I can't do more. Mm -hmm. God needs to do it. Mm -hmm. And she has people that invite her over and all these kind of things that I'm not doing. So.